Welcome, folks. Uh, we're going to have a very entertaining session. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be incredibly insightful. And we have some of Australia's leaders at the table here. Phil Gewen from um, the AFA, a legend in his own time. I was almost going to go elsewhere. Charlotte Henry from Norton Rose. Marcus O'Sullivan, the CEO of Athenia, and Nerida Cole, who has been everywhere, the head of advice, etc., cetera, at um, Evans Dixon. So we're going to talk today and have a decent, a positive outlook on financial advice and the future of financial advice. I thought I'd just start off with a nice general question. So what needs to be done to encourage people to seek advice? What's currently missing out to you, Phil? What's missing out? Um, I think the first thing, and we did some research last year, and, and it showed that the majority of people don't seek financial advice uh, because they think they can do it themselves. Um, and therefore, they don't actually know the value of financial advice. So one of our biggest challenges is actually to uh, communicate to the general public what the value of financial advice is. Because we know when people seek financial advice, they're emotionally, financially, and behaviorally, behave, their behaviors are better. <laughs> Um, they're much better off. So it really is about creating a positive public perception about financial advice, but also understanding what financial advice is and what it can do for you personally. And I think that's one of our, our biggest challenges. I thought the ASIC report that came out recently was quite good on that subject too. Is that a fair comment? Yeah, I, I think it, it did illustrate the value of financial advice. Um, but again, it comes back to the fact that you know people... Uh, don't see that value unless they actually experience it themselves. And as talked about earlier, you know, those who have a financial advisor are actually comfortable with their financial advisor, the majority of them. They're comfortable with their financial advisor. They feel they have a plan. I mean, everyone has a coach. You know, even Warren Buffett's got a mentor. Mm. Um, so you need uh, financial advice to actually help to get, you know, your goals, uh, both your personal and financial goals. And it's actually getting that message out to the general public. Yeah, narrative? Yeah, Phil, I think, you know, backing up what you said, but even maybe going a bit, bit further there, I think um, there's been various studies that have shown that those people that do have a financial advisor, more than just being comfortable with it, they're actually really happy with the advice. I think something like 80% of people are very satisfied with the advice once they've engaged with that financial advisor. So it's really thinking about that continued focus on trying to break down some of the barriers to the general public that haven't yet had that engagement to, to feeling like, well, actually, I could approach a financial advisor and they could help my situation. And I think some of that is what is happening right now in the industry where we're seeing an evolution in the type of advice models that people can access, more coaching, more one-of advice meetings. And I think that's where we're seeing, I guess, a lot of potential to reach those other people that haven't yet come in and, and, and had a meeting with a financial advisor. And Marcus, your view of the world? I think one of the really positive themes from the ASIC report, um, as well as, you know, people like dealing with their advisors, they feel better having advice, was also the amount of people who intend to seek advice. Uh, I thought that was a very positive statistic, uh, particularly for people running advice businesses out there, um, to know that people do want to see them and th there is going to be an influx of people that will want advice. Like the world isn't getting any easier and it's not getting any less complex. Mm. So as we keep building layers of complexity, people need the help. Yes, and I think we can be quite confident the government's never going to simplify anything either. Well, particularly super. Yeah, particularly super. Now, speaking of lawyers, Charlotte, <laughs> I presume you have a financial planner. So what's your view of the future? I think the whole industry has been paying lawyers lots of money in the last couple of years. Do you think there's a whole story around people now getting financial advice? Yeah, well, certainly from a, um, from a UK um, perspective and a, and a European perspective, I mean, there's lots of, lots of studies that have been done in the UK since RDR. Um, the financial advice market review has done numerous sort of um, testing, data, studies, et cetera. Uh, and I think they're still finding that over 50% of the market is still saying they don't need advice. And so I guess sort of what we're seeing in the UK, and obviously there's still market studies coming out and more data being produced, is that there's kind of that early engagement in terms of customer education. Uh, and that's starting at school, so introducing financial um, school uh, in, in classrooms. So people are then aware of, you know, when they need to seek advice and what they need to seek advice for. 
Oh, no, it sounds absolutely fascinating. And the lessons from RDR in Australia around the future of financial advice, what should we be aware of? What should we be aware of? Well, there's lots of different um, themes playing out here, which are very similar to what played out um, in, in the UK. Um, you know, sort of the, the kind of the, the year one horizon knee-jerk themes, but then also more, more longer term. And I guess some of the themes that, um, that we've seen play out in the UK, I mean, obviously robo-advice, which I know we're going to talk about a little bit later on, that was touched this morning in the panel session as well, is very much in its infancy. Um, and I think it does serve a particular need for a particular customer segment, but it's definitely not a panacea for, for, for everything. Um, so the rise of that, um, the rise of the encouraging advisors to go into the market, and I know this was touched on in the earlier session as well. Um, so I think um, some of the reports that were done um, in the UK, you know, I think some of like over 70% of businesses had no advisors under the age of 30. And so it's trying to encourage, you know, the advice gap now is not people that can't access advice, but actually the advisors to actually provide that advice. Um, so that's probably two main broad themes. Um, I mean, I think also there's a generational piece, which I'm sure we'll touch on around sort of valuing advice and the cost of advice. Um, and then also the role of technology to help advisors, which I know was also touched on in the earlier session. And I know you're new to our fine country, but do you think Australia is more complex or less complex from an advice perspective than the United Kingdom? It seems quite similar. Um, right. um, so crazily complex, is that what you <laughs> Lots of regulation, regulation increasing, <laughs> yeah, architectural layers of regulation and more and more complexity and cost. I think the overarching thing is that we need a positive narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when we talk to, to even politicians, they say, give us case studies. Um, make it human and make it positive uh, because the only narrative around financial advice is the negative things that come up. You know, for the thousands of advisors, you know, we saw the 20, it's now 27,000 advisors on the file register. The majority of those are great experiences, um, but we only hear the, the ones that are negative experiences and that goes through the media, um, through the government. Uh, if we can create the positive narrative and I think a professional um, industry helps in that because we can remove the barriers to considering advisors professionals, um, and then that creates the positive narrative to the to the clients. And I think as well, Phil, it helps with then attracting those new people into the industry exactly. because they view financial advice more akin to the accountants in terms yep. of that process, and to lawyers as well with the you know the degree, the standard post grad sort of qualification, and the professional year. And I think that will help us a lot in terms of attracting quality candidates to come through and to help evolve the industry. Totally agree. Yep. You hear in universities now they're encouraging people to do financial planning as a degree. Have we seen that coming through into dealer groups yet or is it too early to see people saying, I would like to be a financial planner? I think it's probably too early. Um, I know some work that we've done um, with La Trobe University down in Melbourne. Um, I did a guest lecture for them some time ago and just asking the students in the room, you know, who wants to be a financial planner? No one puts a hand up. You say, who wants to be an investment banker? And half the room goes up. And then you say, who wants to work for a funds management company? And the other half goes up. So there's a real opportunity we have, and I'd probably defer to Phil and, and people like Dante as well to this, the work that we have to do in universities um, to be seen. And to, to Nerida's point, which was very good, once we're a profession, then people will seek to be a part of the profession. Yep. But we've got to do it properly. We've got to do it like law firms and whatnot and accounting firms and have good grad programs and those type of things to capture the talent out of university. But I, I think, I honestly believe we're a few years away from that. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. I mean, most of the advisors in the industry are career changers. They didn't go through school wanting to be a financial advisor. Um, they took, you know, life experience and converted that into something that they love, love doing. Um, our challenge is now through the schools. Now we uh, will be considered a profession. As Nerida said, people will actually be enthusiastic about becoming something that they believe is reputable and professional and can actually help people in the same process. Uh, I do think we're a bit early, but I, you know, I think that's our challenge, but it's a, our greatest opportunity. I mean, we saw from Jason that, you know, there's been two plus thousand advisors coming off the, the FAR register in the last, uh, well, in the last few months. Um, I think there's been something like 18 new advisors coming in the last, in the first six months of this year, um, which means that the pipeline is fairly dry, but it's a great opportunity once we create that professional image to encourage more people to come through. And do you think the AFA and the FPA need to do some work um, helping people or assisting advisors help run a, 
a professional year program for people coming in? Is there any plans in that area? Oh, certainly from our perspective. I mean, one of the benefits that we bring is that we bring a community together so we can share best practice. Mm. Um, so we can see, you know, we look, you know, um, we saw from Jason some, you know, some practice models. Um, and so what we can do is we can take the best of those practice models and share how they operate. I mean, advisors are great at sharing. Um, they don't see themselves as competitors. Yeah. They actually want, everyone wants to, to raise the bar. Everyone wants to improve the standard. Uh, so they can show how they operate, um, what is best practice, uh, what are the specialities. Um, so I think there is a, a, a huge opportunity there, but there's a lot of distraction at the moment. There's education, there's compliance, there's changing licensees because they're closing down. Um, so there's a, you know, there's a balance between moving forward and dealing with the issues at the moment. It's also this crazy little thing called the code that comes in on the 1st of January, which <laughs> um, to a discussion I had with Phil before, whilst that takes a fair bit of heat out from a regulatory point of view, in, um, industry associations point of view, as a licensee, we're fair square in the gun on the 1st of January. Yeah. Um, so and there's still a lot we can't navigate around. So that's going to be interesting as well. So to Phil's point, I think we're a way away. Yeah. And Nerida, inside your AFSL? Well, yeah, I, I think um, supporting what Phil and Marcus said mm. there as well. But in terms of just going back, maybe the start of your question about the professional year for uh, mm. graduates, it, it is a lot of work and it mm. requires a lot of coordination across the licensee or the business to make sure you've got the time, the framework, the paperwork to document all of that. But from an advisor's point of view as their supervisor, it also requires a commitment of time to actually get that person to the right level and, and manage not just, you know, I guess learning the advisor skills, but also learning all of the compliance and the framework and the business management side of things. It's very time consuming. Uh, it takes you away from seeing clients. And so that needs to be, you know, something that businesses build in um, and it can be quite challenging. <laughs> to say the least. And do you think the new graduates have the people skills to be able to sell their services, so to speak? I think they're just like advisors. I think they're mixed, you know. Some graduates come out of um, uni and just absolutely knock the socks off you in terms of how um, how good they are, their interpersonal skills, how well they can um, present themselves, and others are much less so in that space, and that's what they need to work on. And I guess that's the, I guess the positive sign for us in the industry is being able to pick those people out and to train them up and actually to then get them out there to help clients by, by um, you know, developing whatever skills it is they need. And I think from a UK perspective, just to comment yeah. on the sort of attracting new advisors, I mean, certainly um, so the trends that we're seeing over there are that it's not just a one size fits all. So going to market saying, you know, this is not how you have to be an advisor, yeah. you know, challenge us to make the industry better. What would you do? So I think it's breaking down that traditional perspective of, you know, a person sitting in a room giving financial advice and encouraging people that they could actually change the industry how they can see the opportunity. So actually not presenting a, this is what financial advice is, but you know, you, you help us encourage us to see how the, how the market could be. Absolutely, Charlotte. And we're yeah. seeing that here in Australia with some of the newer businesses that have set up. Generally, they're quite small, but they might be doing more things like um, you know, a coaching program, mm. a 12-week coaching program or a money workshop and quite a different style to your traditional meeting sort of arrangement. But that seems to be certainly attracting interest from certain consumer segments. And, and it does also give you other potential advisors a different way to engage where they might want to do the sort of sit down one-on-one -on -one meetings five times a day. They might be more happy to sit in front of a room full of people and have a, have a much more um, bigger engagement. Mm. But the soft, the, I was going to say the soft skills point is a, is a really big one because that's, that's one of our biggest challenges at the moment, but it's a, it's a great opportunity. I mean, what we don't want to see is really, you know, excellent advisors with great soft skills leaving the industry um, and we know that there are people at the moment who are you know bringing forward retirement plans um, or just don't want to be um, in a situation where they feel uh, and I know there's been a lot of great results in passing the exam um, you know but I was talking to an advisor the other day he said I just don't type that quickly um, I'm afraid to do the exam uh, he's an excellent advisor and he's got great people skills that he can pass on to that next generation. And so our key is to be able to keep that experience and pass it on because all the degree in the world will not help you relate to a client and help 
find out what their personal goals, what their fears are, what their desires are. That won't come out of the textbook. Marcus, any views from inside your shop? Um, I think for us, and, and probably picking up on a few themes, um, with the professional year, that, that is going to be difficult for smaller practices. Um, Jason made the point about the future practice being that corporatised practice, probably look at some, something like Nerida's business. Um, they'll have the resources and the scale to be able to conduct a PY, but the smaller two advisor practices out there, they're really going to struggle. Yep. And, you know, to Phil's point, it's the, the passing down of those soft skills and the interpersonal skills that young graduates would really, really, I think, enjoy and flourish with. That's where we're at risk of losing. Um, and not being able to pass those things down. And then if you put the overlay of the increasing cost in, in being a financial planner, then if you're taking yourself away from generating revenue, then it, it just doesn't work. Charlotte, all the lessons from the legal profession, you go and get a degree, you then become very technical, you then become a partner, and then you have to sell. Right. So what can we learn from the legal profession as the financial advice industry goes through this journey? Interesting question. Um, <laughs> um, I, I think in broad brush terms, you know, I think law firms are no longer just pick up the phone, charge by the hour, go out and find clients. You know, we've all had to reorientate towards delivering robo-legal advice, providing commoditized services, what's more value add. You know, moving into risk compliance, not just you know solving regulatory risk, legal risk, not just focusing on providing legal advice. It's about managing risk. So I think we have had to reorientate, and you know, being part of a global law firm, we benefit from you know global resources and um, the ability to have global tools. But you know, gone are the days where you know, there's certainly a role for trusted advisor at a strategic level. Um, but a, a lot of work now is commoditized. You know, clients expect us to use legal tools actually to deliver. Um, the output that they want. So I think you need to use a range of tools to be able to deliver your service, not just what worked in the past. Yeah. Good point. So, Phil, who's leaving the industry? We saw Jason's grid before. What mm. was your view of who's exiting stage left? Uh, well, I think there's different groups. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think there's, there's people who are always going to retire. Um, there are those who have probably brought forward those plans. Uh, because they're looking at the, the threshold and looking at the fact that doing an exam and then a degree, um, by the time I finish that, um, you know, how many years will I be working as an advisor? Um, I mean, some of them, uh, they see that they're going to continue to work. So there's that group of, of advisors getting close to retirement. Um, there are some who are still making up their mind, uh, and that's because they're in a position where a lot of advisors are small business operators. They, they're there because they like to control their future. They like to help other people, but they also like to control their future. And at the moment, they feel as if they're not in control. They feel as if someone else is controlling their future. You have to do the exam. We all know that that's, that's a necessity, uh, but that's a fear. Um, and then they don't feel in control of it. Uh, I think what Dante said earlier um, was absolutely right, that you know, advisors should give it a crack and start early. Um, because they might surprise themselves um, because they've got the knowledge. It's just finding, doing that practice to get through the exam and then starting maybe one unit of study and realising that actually I can actually benefit from this. Uh, so I, as I say, it's a lot of people bringing forward their retirement plans or some people who are in a small business that, that they just can't be financially viable. Um, we've seen changes in remuneration around life insurance framework, so upfront commissions have been reduced. Um, grandfathering uh, removed uh, and a lot more pressure on financial advice as well as the cost to provide that advice um, it has made it so that some people actually can't continue a sustainable business model. I must admit I've been surprised how many people have actually gone in and tried to do the exams and actually obviously the pass rates have been good. Yep. Is it part of the fact that advisor practices have dropped in value so much in the last year or two that they actually think I've got to work longer and there's a group of them who are actually going to go through the pain barrier of the exams. Is that fair, Marcus? Or Yeah, I think so. Um, and, and you're right around valuations and whatnot and that will probably continue to trend down and, until we get through this period and everyone's educated and we emerge as you know Australia's newest profession. Um, I think values will start to rebound then. But I, I think that's a very fair point that you make. The people have gone, well, I've got to be here. Um, it's just whether or not 
one thing's passing the exam and I, I definitely respect and appreciate the anxiety around doing that, particularly for people that haven't been in formal education settings for sometimes decades. Um, but it's the, I just don't think we should undersell the education journey um, in particular. And I know Stephen made the point in the last session about, you know, you can just do, you know, eight subjects in a postgrad. That's eight postgrad subjects. That's not eight undergraduate subjects. They're very different workloads. Um, so I, I just think we've got to be conscious of that. So I think a lot more will do the exam. It's just whether or not they continue on the journey. And, you know, bringing forward retirement dates, as Phil said, I think a lot will be determined um, if the extension to the exam and the education is actually passed. Yeah, I've got a review on it. Well, yeah, I think that is um, a challenge for a lot of a lot of advisors, particularly as we as we just heard that the people that have been in the industry for a while maybe haven't studied for a while. It's pretty mm. daunting to go back and have to do the exam and all of the other study components along with it. And again, more time away from seeing clients or more time that you got to find in your day. It's very challenging. Yeah. I was shocked to see responsible managers may have to do it as well. This is a whole new world for them too. Are they aware of it? Are AFSL holders? in the same category, et cetera. What's your view, Phil? I, I think there would be a lot of advisors who um, who would think that there's more than just responsible managers that should have to do the education. Yes. Um, Agreed. There's, I mean, if, if people are going to be experts in this area, um, then whether they're advising or not, it makes sense that they have the same qualifications. So I think you could extend that to to a number of people, not just responsible managers. Agreed. And you're seeing ANZIF kick off a whole program with a number of life insurers about upgrading skills and claims, underwriting, product management and distribution. So it will be interesting to see how it goes. And so what's a lawyer have to do nowadays, Charlotte, on continuous education? Same as advisors. So Same as advisors, is it? Et cetera. So um, well, that's good to hear because that means the income of advisors is going to be very good, Marcus. It sounds a very rosy future, doesn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Class is always helpful. Exactly. The positive thing, Simon, is the, the fact that, um, uh, you know, the Assistant Minister, Senator Jane Hume, has taken an active um, role in the industry since she's come on board since the election um, and recognised that whilst we're on a professional journey, um, that, you know, it's it's a big project and it's taken longer than anyone expected. Um, so to propose the legislation to push back, the, to, to extend the exam dates and the degree dates is common sense. Um, and, you know, there's no indication that that, that um, legislation won't go through. Uh, and I think it's great to see that there's, there's actually a lot of engagement to make sure that we balance the professional journey with retaining the experience and ensuring that advisors can be financially viable. So ultimately, ultimately they can give affordable advice to their clients. Is that a concern you have, Nerida, about the affordable advice issue? Because we've got a lot of regulation coming through, people are going to invest a lot getting a degree and so on. So what's your view of where it's going to end up? Oh, absolutely. I think um, like many people in the industry would, would have that concern around the affordability of advice and particularly around as you said, the amount of regulation, the amount of red tape, and Dante mentioned earlier as well when he was talking in his session about, you know, the 100-page SOA, I think most advisors would love to have something that is more succinct and palatable for a client to actually read and get, but it becomes so, you know, difficult to do that while meeting all of the sort of uh, disclaimers and disclosures and, and so forth. I think where it's heading, though, is this sort of... Um, evolution around the advice that that you know focusing on particular areas where there's a real need and, and a strength from your advisor but say for example you know um and i think this will happen more and more because people's family lives are getting more complicated as we live longer you know maybe you're specializing in giving advice on divorce or maybe you're specializing on giving advice to people that are entering a second marriage with perhaps older kids uh, or you know people that are um, moved overseas or whatever, different sort of categories where you can be quite a specialist in that. Um, and that might help for those advisors that are going to be still giving the one-on-one -on -one advice to be able to be quite efficient in giving those, um, giving that quality advice that is still going to make a difference to that person's life. Are you saying that, Marcus, inside of any of that? Yeah, look, definitely. Um, and particularly to, to some of Nerida's points, um, just this whole emergence of, of this specialist aged care Market. 
Um, obviously, it's strategy work. It's not product work. Um, so that that's really becoming popular. And with an ageing demographic, it probably makes a lot of sense. But I think on the cost front, I, I think advisors do need to get more efficient in what they do. Um, that's not just from a regulatory cost point of view. If you look at it, there's costs for the TPB, there's ASIC levies, there's dealer fees, PI's not getting any cheaper, um, all those type of things. And then, you know, you've got un unknown costs that are coming down the barrel at us as well. Things like compensation scheme of last resort, who's going to fund that, how's it going to be funded? Um, the single disciplinary body, uh, which was, I think, recommendation 2.1 in the Royal Commission, um, for that to be established um, or not established, whether or not those powers and code enforcement powers actually go to an existing body, um, say an ASIC or a FARSI or someone like that, that's going to have to be funded as well. Yeah, I agree. Now, oh, sorry, Charlotte, any other comments you'd make on that yeah. from a legal perspective? I'll just say, well, not necessarily from a legal perspective, maybe from a sort of other market perspective in terms of models of advice. Um, and we're certainly sort of seeing that sort of in the decade post RDR um, in that there's much more an increase in focusing on sort of matching the advice to actually what customers want. So not sort of one, one um, size fits all in terms of a holistic financial planner, but matching it. So yes, you know, Robo will, will help with some customer needs, but otherwise it's specialised advice. It might be an investment review, you know, a particular question, a tax question. So, so sort of orient, orientating someone's, um, offering to to a particular need, um, and we certainly have seen that in the UK. Um, and there's a study coming out; um, it's currently being finished off, but due early next year, sort of relooking at that and the trends and that kind of that kind of market, which I think we want to want to have a look at. And I think now, somewhere, was, oh, sorry, I, was gonna say, I think that was mentioned even in a, a recent report that came out the last couple of days from ASIC, and they looked at advice from superannuation funds and um, indicated a very high percentage of people are getting self-directed advice through a digital channel as well. So there's definitely seems to be, as you said, that sort of picking what yeah. channel suits your situation. Yeah, I, I would, would say though that sort of, and I know we might come to Robo Advice a little bit later on, but certainly Robo Advice in the UK, you know, majority of it, apart from potentially in-house offerings, has been loss leading and a lot of advisors have had to close down. So I think the model will need to be looked at and work for the, the sector, um, but the moment it's sort of in its infancy. Um, but, but yes, I mean, there's also the platform study, which, which again is played out in the UK, and there's a really, there's a real increase the regulator want to want platforms to do more guidance so that people can do more sort of DIY investing. That's not a bad segue, Nerida, to an excellent question from the audience, which is around the ASIC versus Westpac case and general advice. Has it died? <laughs> Is it going to continue, do you think, or is it going to have an impact on advice? It could actually be a good thing and push people towards personal advice, but on the other hand, it may actually limit the market quite substantially. Phil, what's your view? Um, I think the conversation earlier was, was spot on insofar as the, there was real confusion around general advice. Um, and anything with the word in advice in it implies that the client, I believe, thinks that their full circumstances are being taken into consideration. Um, and, you know, that's why we've recommended against the use of term, the term general advice, um, because, you know, clients assume a level of knowledge when they're being given um, general advice, um, and it's not necessarily taking into consideration all of their, their personal circumstances. There's a balance. I mean, not everyone can afford full financial advice but we need to make sure that people understand um, what level of advice that they're receiving um, and that, that um, what, you know, what personal circumstances have been taken into consideration there. Yeah, yeah. I, I would agree with Phil. I think, you know, general advice does need to be more clearly defined. And I think that's the Financial Services Council's position as well on that, um, because, you know, it can be confusing for a consumer. Mm -hmm. They don't really understand the difference in what they're not getting. But we also know, I guess, when you talked about does that mean more personal advice, we also know that there's, you know, while personal advice can be very helpful for many people, not all consumers want personal advice and want to go through that whole process. They might just want a bit of guidance around, you know, what is the um, threshold where the co-contribution cuts in and, and very simple issue type advice. Um, and, and then again, for others, we're definitely seeing people want this more education sort of service. And I think understanding how that fits in and giving that 
um, choice to consumers is really important as well. So we, we do want to make sure we don't get down a pathway that's just so narrow, there's no options for people, but it does have to have enough protections in there for consumers that they understand what they're not getting. Yes, true. And I think it gets interesting general advice, intrafund advice, personal advice. It's factual all advice. Factual, factual advice. Factual information, advice. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, Marcus, it is getting complex for people and you need a lawyer, so you've got one to your left. Um, <laughs> I won't ask Charlotte yet, but I think it is getting very complex for customers to sort their way through. Do you? It is, but I, I agree with the comments that Nerida and Phil have made as well. People need choice. Um, to fulfil a, a, an advice need or to fulfil a product need. Um, so people need mul multiple entry points into those markets. And I think Nerida's point was very well made. If we make it so narrow that it's only one option for fulfilment, then I think we're just going to push more people away. Mm. Agreed. And in the UK, we was said we'd get to robo. So some people kind of go, it's personal advice or robo, or do you think in the UK it actually was personal advice and robo? Um, well, robo is a form of personal advice. <laughs> um, so it's in, in the UK context, there's a distinction between similar to here, personal advice and general advice. Um, and I think how it was sort of, and there's also different layers of personal advice. So there's your kind of your, your independent whole of market advice, and then there's your restricted. So as was touched on the earlier conversation, um, presentation about sort of vertically integrated firms Know, only advising on certain things, or also only advising on you know Sharia compliant products or whatever it happens to be. Um, I think in the UK there's there's been an orientation away from the different categories of advice, apart from independent and restricted, but more towards look this is this is guidance. This is not advice. This is guidance. And then advice still covers all the different avenues that someone might want to touch on an advisor. So whether it's robo, whether it's a, specific, a specified need, whether it's simplified advice, that is all still categorised as advice with the same standards, albeit lighter touch regulation on some of them. Um, but it's definitely something that even in the UK now, decades on from, or decade on from RDR, you know, that everyone is still wanting that clarity between making a customer understand what is advice and what is guidance. And also similar to here, there is this um, reluctance of the regulator to want customers to rely and firms to rely on disclosure, uh, but more of an understanding. So it's more of a customer education piece, I think. And it makes it interesting for the various models that advisors have too, Marcus. You've got the, the professionals who are out there on the corporatised journey. You've got the clusters of advisors. How do you think it's all going to play out? I think I don't make the distinction between, particularly when we're talking about tech and digi space and, and robo and those things, I don't make the distinction between big firms having it and small firms not. I think everyone's got to have it. Um, it's just whether or not there's a robo model or the other model which we're we do a lot of thinking about is advisor-driven robo. Mm. Um, if you listen to people like Joe Durant from United Capital in America and those type of businesses, you know, 100% of your future revenue as an advisor and in a corporate is going to be driven by your client experience. And you're going to have to have those digi platforms to be omnipresent for your clients because if you're not, the experience won't be there and it will impact your revenue. And that's certainly, sorry, that's certainly something we saw in the UK market. So particularly with the kind of the, the, the fallout that we had from RDR, similar to what you're seeing here, you, you know, there are a portion of customers that still need to be served. It's now not cost effective for firms to do that. And then looking to increase the channel that you're, um, or have different channels to engage with customers and much more of a need to want to then move to how do customers normally interact with uh, with their service providers. So are they wanting like a WhatsApp type channel where they can still get that advice, but you're not having to spend the time and the cost and the effectiveness. You're still, it's not robo, you're still getting that advice, but different channels for doing it. And that's actually been really successful in the UK. And is Evans Dixon investing in this whole area, bot chats, et cetera, et cetera? Um, I'm not sure about bot chats, <laughs> or chat bots, um, but certainly, you know, I guess probably like other people here as well, investing in a lot of the digital solutions to make sure advisors can do their work as efficiently as possible as being a huge part of the business. Um, so, you know, trying to make the SOA creation, the calculation of any strategies as effective and as quick as possible, but also having better tools around that engagement with clients. And I think this is a, for me, it's a good example because when I started as an advisor back in the day, being able to do those 
calculations around a, a client's future position at retirement were, were hugely time intensive. Mm. And now you've got so many calculators and tools that basically, you know, you press enter and boom, away it goes and it looks fantastic as well. And that can be a really effective way for clients to engage and get a better, I guess, picture of what's happening and what, what they might need mm. to consider. But again, the technological advancements we've had over the last 10 years on that has made a big difference in terms of the, their client experience and what they value. So probably backing up the last two points there, you know, knowing as advisors where we can add that value and really focusing on that is critical because otherwise if clients can get a very cheap solution via some sort of robo or digital or chatbot solution, why are they going to pay the extra to come and have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with you? And you really need to be clear about that extra add-on value. I think that's a great point in terms of engagement. It comes back to your very first question, Simon, about people seeking more advice. The more technology can engage people earlier, because you know one of the biggest challenges is people don't get advice because they don't have enough money. And it's when they get to retirement and they start to think about advice, um, anything technological that can actually engage people with money, with finances, and start to educate them um, is great. But then if they start to see the need that then can transform into personal financial advice at a later stage. But I think it's great to engage people at an early stage. And do you find that also at the AFO tell that your mechanism for communicating to advisors is changing, that they're expecting more technology in the way you interact? Yeah, look, we're still trying to work out the best way to communicate to, to our advisors because um, everyone's so busy and everyone's getting so much um, information. And, um, you know, that's that's one of the things. That's why people need advice because they get so much information, they don't know what to do with it. Uh, same with our members. I mean, we're, we're having to communicate in different ways, whether it's social, whether it's, you know, the traditional um, EDMs, uh, you know, we still have a very high open rate um, and receipt rate of our printed magazine. Um, it's very popular because people still want to, you know, touch and feel and, and, and read it. So anything we can do to, to engage, um, you know, we just need to find different ways because everyone has different, different preferences. Charlotte, you mentioned changes in the UK and how they came through. Could you describe those for us here? What actually happened post RDR on advisor numbers? How did organisations like St James Place respond? The difference in the models of IFAs, and then I think you described it as almost a line type advisors. How does all that operate? Because I think people would be interested in that. Yeah, well, I think it's similar to the themes we're seeing here. So the, the initial sort of reaction from RDR was um, a lot of advisors falling out of the market. Um, I think when the study was last done, um, there was sort of one in five were leaving the market, again, through sort of planned retirement, which may have been brought forward a bit more. Um, the recent study done by Octopus Investments um, this year said that over the next decade, they expect that to increase. So it'll be a lot more like one in four, et cetera. So I, so I think we've definitely seen that financial advisor space and trying to encourage people to come into the market. So that's one theme, I think, which was a consequence of, of that. Um, there was also this fear that there would be a underserved part of the population. So those with not high investment um, pots um, might necessarily not be able to access, which is obviously the advice gap. Um, um, and that hasn't, I think, really played out in practice. I think everyone feared that would be the case. Um, and there certainly are some sectors of the market over there where you know, they don't fall into the sort of the private banking model or the high net worth advisor model, which definitely did play out in the UK. Um, but it hasn't been as as bad as, as feared, I think, initially. Um, then there was also the crease in compliance and the cost all around that. So, I mean, I think very similar themes to what, what has played out here. Um, but then there was sort of the horizon too. So, obviously, we've had the initial fallout from Maria. Again, similar themes with advisors, you know, lamenting the compliance costs, the increased cost of their business model, the loss of commission, all that type of stuff. But now people have really reoriented um, to, to new ways of working, I think it's safe to say. So you have these very large advisor networks which are subject to the single supervision of an organisation and they have grown. Um, and to come to the entity that, that you named, you know, the kind of the loose collection of IFAs that can fit from, you know, back office and middle office support, that's also grown. Um, but also the bank assurance model, so a lot more in-house advisors, um, which is obviously more of a European theme as well. So sort of the models are changing um, in, in the vertically integrated that was touched on the last panel, so people only advising on in-house in-house products. Um, then there has been the rise of 
Provo or certainly people dabbling in it. Um, I think the platforms are one of the areas where it's grown a lot. So the, the SCA in the UK has really called to the market, the platform market, to try and help customers be able to find the investment they're looking for without it necessarily being advice. And there's a lot of platform supermarkets in the UK that have really taken that up. Um, but there are lots of different sort of advice, and, it's, and I guess this is coming back to what I touched on earlier about sort of the models of advice. In the UK market, people are more orient, orienting their advice to what customers are wanting, so the specialised advice, the one-off advice, the you know, if it's a tax advice, et cetera, not just doing a, you know, all I can offer you is a, a whole of, whole of portfolio review financial advice. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, I don't necessarily think that you know, the, the UK has all, has all the answers, but I mean, <laughs> obviously, we've had a, had a decade of, of RDR. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, the last review of the market was done in 2017, and it's, it's been done again now. And so I think next year when the report's out, it'll be quite good to look to see how, how trends and developments have, have moved on. Which is a wonderful segue to the next issue I'd like to discuss. So, Phil, we have a mountain of legislation coming through. The Royal Commission is going to smash it up between now and next Christmas, not mm. this Christmas. Should we have a review of the whole landscape in a couple of years' time to see what has gone well and what hasn't gone well? And should we be actually advocating for that now as an industry? Wow. Um, more change, more reviews. Um, look, I, I think... Look, there's some common sense reviews. Uh, you know, there's always we're obviously on a time frame. You know, the government's determined to you know, to implement all 76 recommendations of the Royal Commission, um, and 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 that's a fact. Um, we were already on a professional journey. Um, you know, professional standards legislation had already been passed. Uh, the life insurance framework um, had already been passed. Um, so we're already on a significant journey in terms of. Um, you know, in terms of where the industry was going as a profession. Uh, I think the biggest challenge for us post all of this is how do we cut the red tape? Mm. How do we simplify it so that advisors can actually afford to give advice to average Australians who need it the most? That's our, that's our biggest challenge. Um, so, we, yes, we're on a professional journey. Royal Commission recommendations are going to be introduced, but anything that we can do to then look at, okay, now we've got this, I mean, single disciplinary body is a great example. If we take this opportunity to look at the entire environment, as opposed to just dropping the single disciplinary body, we could save, you know, a lot of red tape and make the, make the industry a lot more efficient and a lot more streamlined. Um, so we can actually afford to do what we need to do. Yeah, I think so, Simon. Um, even though I loathe to, to support another review, <laughs> another round of regulatory change or anything, but I think the reality is, if we if we don't have one within the next couple of years, we, we kind of get this kind of um, round uh, where nothing happens, and then it's a very hard sledgehammer approach. But I feel what's happening. You know, we've got the Royal Commission changes coming through, but we've also got quite a massive evolution going on mm. anyway around advice, the, the, the types of services people are providing and the technology that we are using to provide advice that in a couple of years' time, it's highly likely when we're going to be able to see there's quite a few gaps or there's quite a few areas that are overly um, regulated, perhaps duplicated in terms of the level of mm. regulation, that if we can try and um, review that, improve that, then we have a better system going forward. And just as an example, you know, what we've talked about today here with some of these niche advice areas and aged care and people perhaps becoming, you know, like they have in the US, elders advisors or advisors on this or that, how are they actually regulated when they might not be even providing financial product advice under the current definition? And so those things will need to be perhaps brought into the system as well in the next few years. And if we leave it too long, that's when, as I said, I fear we get that knee-jerk reaction to something. Agreed. And you look at things like the Tax Practitioners Board, their code of ethics, um, um, the ethics they have, and then you have the fazier ones, etc. It gets complex out there, doesn't it, Marcus? Yeah, it does. And, and look, if you look at our regulatory space, it's very crowded. You yeah. know, we've got seven regulators. Um, to Nerida's point, surely there's double up between them. I see a huge opportunity for us with this single disciplinary body to look at the functions in each of the regulators and uh, where there are double ups, can they just be moved into another regulator? Yep. Um, and without establishing something new or having yet another person on the block, let's just see what, what cross functions can be done across. You know, you've got ASIC who look after advice quality and, and enforcement, then you've got ASIC 
uh, AFCA who look after compensating clients where harm's been done. You know, could that function all be done in one place? You know, you've got Farsia who um, may or may not become the single disciplinary body, who knows? Um, once everyone's through the exam and if we still have this low level of entrance coming into the industry and everyone's passed their qualifications, then I guess what role do they have in, in continuing um, with, you know, I suppose education enforcement in the industry? So I, I think there's a lot of cleanup that could be done and, and it could be done now. Right. Any comments from the UK? You've had a review 2017. Any hot issues there? Uh, well, I think maybe not from, or maybe from the UK, but I think I've yet to come across a jurisdiction where the regulator thinks that less regulation is probably going to be <laughs> the better way of doing things. Um, so, so I definitely think that simplification would help. Um, it just needs to have buy-in. Um, yeah. Certainly from the UK, the regulator there is, I think, slightly different to the regulators here, and that they're open to re-looking at what they've done and rowing back, deregulating. Um, but not sure if it'll play out in a similar way here. Right. Well, the last question for the panel, for the whole panel, what is the most burning platform issue for advisors today? Charlotte, I think I'll leave you out of this one because it'd be unfair. I've given everyone else enough time to think about it. What is the most burning issue today? Oh, that's easy from my point of view, the code. And that's the issues around three and seven, et cetera. Well, it's two, three, six, seven. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there are probably issues with a few of them. Look, it, it's it's more so from a, a licensee perspective. The, the, you know, we, we're the code bodies as of the 1st of January, so we have to have a position and we have to have a position that meets the requirements of the code and, and upholds the code, and it's really important that we do that. Um, but then we also mix in with, as you said, we've got a TPB code, an AFA code, an FPA code, a uh, FASIA code. So, yeah, it's just navigating that. So that, that takes up most of our time at the moment, and, it, and it's, yeah, it, it, it comes with a degree of anxiety of how, how we're going to proceed. I can almost feel an income protection claim coming on then. And the throw just a stroke. Yeah. <laughs> as long as it's a current contract yeah. um, <laughs> on income protection, that's another issue as well. Yes. Um, look, obviously, in terms of time, the code is an issue, uh, I think. And, and hats off to, to, to ASIC and APRA insofar as the announcement around you know, facility um, compliance is, is a good first step. Um, and it has alleviated a lot of the concern. Um, but I do think that we are now in a heightened state of uh, where advisors want to be doing the right thing all the time and want to be seen to be doing the right thing. And when it's not black and white, um, it's very concerning for them as to whether they know that they're complying or not. But look, overarching that, the biggest concern is, uh, and I know I've mentioned it a couple of times, is how can advisors structure their business so that they can actually um, do it efficiently, and this is incumbent upon you know, platform providers, product providers to, do, to be more efficient, uh, so as to help them. How do we deliver affordable financial advice to average Australians? So how do we keep the cost served down? Um, that's the biggest challenge that's affecting, I, I would say, the broader network. And Merida, last. Well, best. certainly. Well, I <laughs> certainly what Phil said is very spot on there, and I think um, the code is certainly a concern, but I guess thinking about it from advisors' perspectives, it's that uncertainty around they're trying to make sure they're meeting all these requirements, they get the education pathways in place, uh, and there's that that sort of greyness of what, what does this all mean for me? Um, that's definitely an immediate pressing issue. Uh, and then the uh, structural change that's going on throughout the industry and understanding what it means for their future, I think that is you know really worrying for a lot of advisors uh, who want to be out there giving good advice to consumers and actually helping them and lifting the reputation of the industry, but that, that's in the back of their minds quite regularly. Agreed. Well, thank you very much. Thanks.